All right, well, we were having all that discussion about sociality, and now I'm going to uh, terminate our sociality and go to a formal, uh, 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 more on the leadership model. Uh, and our panel, well, is democracy is public reason, but for the next hour or so, uh, only those of us at the tables will engage in, at the front <laughs> tables will engage in public reason. Um, so our panelists t uh, t today are John Dreisek, Professor of Political Science at the Australian National University, and uh, my first political science teacher in Eugene, Oregon. Lloyd Rudolph, Emeritus Professor of Political Science at the University of Chicago, and Suzanne Huber, Huber Rudolph, Emeritus Distinguished Service Professor of Political Science at the University of Chicago. James Tully, Distinguished Professor of Political Science, Law, Indigenous Governance, and Philosophy at the University of Victoria. And our discussants are uh, Phil Roeder, Professor of Political Science at the University of California, San Diego, and Zhang Sung Yu, Assistant Professor at the School of International Relations and Pacific Studies at University of California, uh, San Diego, and a great scholar. I've been skipping biographies, but I I just have to tell you, he was a leader in the Korean youth move, South Korean uh, youth movement during the time of the autocracy, <laughs> which means he's a courageous man. <laughs> All right, so Amartya Sen has made a number of uh, contributions to democratic theory, and I will mention three. First, economists used to consider only the instrumental effects of democracy, for example, whether liberal democratic regimes or authoritarian regimes most increase the gross national product of a country. Sen insisted as part of his capabilities approach that the freedoms, the, the personal freedoms and the political freedoms are also valuable in themselves, something worth having even if they did not increase a country's material wealth. Maybe some of you would agree with that point of view. <laughs> Second, <clears throat> he also pointed out uh, how democratic uh, governance and its intrinsically valuable freedoms can have enormous instrumental benefits for ci citizens. And uh, his, uh, his, um, uh, his Nobel Prize uh, was indeed for social choice theory, but everyone, um, so I don't want to mislead you about that, but his work on famine is widely noted elsewhere. And in his work on famine, he pointed out as summarized at page 342 of the idea of justice, that, quote, no major famine has ever occurred in a functioning democracy with regular elections, opposition parties, uh, basic freedom of speech, and a relatively free media. And this hypothesis, when it was offered in New York Review of Books 20 or so years ago, is quite controversial and uh, holds up rather well, although we're academics and we, we could go on and on about the possible exceptions if any. As, and as a child, uh, Sen witnessed the Bengal famine of 1943. India had many famines during colonial rule, but had none after democratic independence. Think about that. Public reasoning is both an important freedom for its own sake and also powerfully it protects the lives and freedoms of democratic citizens. Now for today. Third, in the idea of justice, Sen most emphasizes democracy as public reason or government by discussion. He departs from what he calls the closed impartiality of Rawls's territorially isolated original position to an open impartiality inspired by Adam Smith's impartial spectator device. Open art impartiality is open not only to members of a given group and not only to those whose interests are affected, but is open to crit critical scrutiny and public discussion by all. A given group can be stuck in a parochial point of view and can benefit from the contrasting perspectives of outsiders. Finally, even though there is no sovereign global state, and hopefully there never will be, um, <laughs> nevertheless, global justice, especially the correction of specific manifest injustices, can be advanced through public discussion of, by, and for the people of the world, um, Sin says. And 
Um, we'll start in the or uh, just in the order listed in the schedule with John Dreisek. Okay, thanks, Jerry, and thanks, Fana, too, for the, uh, the invitation and for organizing all this. Um, I think it's probably appropriate to begin by uh, congratulating India on their victory in the Cricket World Cup, <laughs> um, which, which they won a few minutes ago, um, and it's about time that somebody other than Australia won it, so well done, <laughs> India. Um, when, when I read the idea of, I, I, read the, I took the idea of justice with me on a, a climbing trip I took to the Himalayas in um, October, last October and November. Um, so I read, I read it at an altitude of over 17,000 feet. So if there are any, any mistakes in what I say, you can blame it on oxygen deprivation. Um, the two most popular topics in political theory over the last 10 or 15 years have been global justice and deliber deliberative democracy. Um, and Sen, of course, brings democracy and justice together very usefully um, in the, the idea of justice and elsewhere. Um, as he says on page 392 of the idea of justice, when we try to determine how justice can be advanced, there is a basic need for public reasoning involving arguments coming from different quarters and divergent perspectives. Um, I think that leads us directly into the idea of deliberative democracy. Um, Sen himself recognizes those connections but doesn't really develop develop them, develop the connection to a deliberative democracy in particular in, in the book. Um, what I'm going to do, what I'm doing in the, in the paper and also in, in this, this short talk is um, um, not, to, not, re not exactly to take issue with anything that Sen says about democracy, um, because I, I actually agree with most of it, but I think uh, that, that there, are so, there are some, there, there's a degree of incompleteness in what he says about democracy and democracy as public reason or, or discussion. Um, so I'll talk about uh, three problems and what I think the theory of democ deliberative democracy can say in speaking to those three problems. The three problems are, um, first, what Sen means by democracy is underspecified in, in the book. Um, secondly, um, pluralism presents some challenges as well as value when it comes to democracy. Challenge, challenges related to deep moral disagreement and deep division. And by deep division, I simply mean deep, deep identity divisions where one group in society, be it defined on the basis of uh, caste, class, um, race, ethnicity, language, or whatever, um, finds, or religion, um, finds its identity in rejection of the identity of another group in society. So that's deep division. Um, and the third is that uh, speaking of public reason in the singular um, can, in fact, undermine pluralism. So we need to pay close attention to what, uh, what public reason uh, can mean, should mean, and how public reason ought to relate to other forms of communication in a democracy. I'll start with underspecification. Um, underspecification comes um, in really, uh, I, I'd say, in, in, in four, four terms. Um, first, who participates? Um, David Crocker, in his excellent book um, called Ethics of Global Development, published a couple of years ago, um, argues that uh, for Sen, what makes most sense is a democracy of the affected. Um, so that all those affected by a decision should be able to participate um, in, well, I'd say deliberation about, about the content of the decision. Um, that immediately has radical implications because those affected may be in different political jurisdictions. So that takes, that takes democracy across national boundaries. Um, when it comes to participants, I would say that um, there, is a, there, there, there are different kinds of participants can bring different kinds of virtues to democracy and that, that in deliberative democracy, um, uh, the, the practice in particular suggests that um, there is a role for non-partisans to be organized into forums, that they can bring particular virtues related to um, reflection and creativity uh, that partisans don't necessarily have. Um, partisans, on the other hand, are much better when it comes to securing legitimacy from the, 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 the social forces that they represent. How do we choose participants in, in public discussion? Um, there are multiple, multiple forms of representation, but I would suggest that when it comes to deliberating across plural justice claims, then one, one kind of representation that is particularly appropriate is discursive representation, um, which I um, described in um, an article a couple of years ago in the American Political Science Review with my colleague uh, Simon Niemeyer, although the term actually was, uh, the term discursive representation was originally coined by Margaret Keck. But the basic idea is that we can think of discursive representatives as, as representing not particular groups of people, but particular discourses or perhaps particular conceptions of justice. So there may be, um, especially when it comes to deliberating plural justice claims, there may be a, a, a strong place for discursive representation. How should dialogue proceed when it comes to public discussion? Um, when it comes to small face-to-face -face forums, we know that good deliberation does not emerge spontaneously, um, that it benefits um, from, uh, from good facilitation 
And so there is a large, uh, a large literature now on the, on the role that um, facilitation, mediation can play in, uh, in, uh, in deliberative democracy and in conflict resolution. The story when it comes to large processes beyond small-scale forums is more complex. Um, there is a role for rhetoric here in the construction and operation of deliberative systems. Um, Tracy Strong, in his comments at the end of his comments yesterday, um, drew a contrast between discursive or deliberative democracy on the one hand and rhetoric on the other. Um, in Political Theory, a journal he used to edit, um, there have been actually a couple of articles in the uh, well, several articles in the last couple of years, um, which actually demolished that distinction between deliberative democracy and rhetoric, including one by uh, the very Habermasian Simone Chambers, um, and which, which point to the, the role that the, 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 the key role that rhetoric can play in deliberative democracy, um, especially when as soon as we move from small-scale face-to-face forums to larger larger systems. Um, I'll, I'll come back to the roles that rhetoric will play in a moment um, when I sp speak about deeply divided societies. Um, how should democracy produce outcomes? Um, Crocker, in his book again, um, suggests that, uh, that, and he's really uh, trying to um, follow Sen as well, um, suggests that what Sunstein calls incompletely theorized agreements are what was known earlier in the deliberative democracy literature as um, workable agreements um, in which, um, which, which uh, uh, partisans of, from different perspectives can subscribe to an agreement for different yet mutually acceptable reasons. Um, is, the, is, 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 the, is, the, is the proper way to produce outcomes in, um, in uh, under democracy as discussion. Okay, um, I'm going to skip deep moral disagreement um, because deep division is, uh, I'll turn to the, um, the, the other aspect of, um, of, of challenges of pluralism, deep division, because it perhaps uh, presents a, a more profound challenge. Now, um, as I said, deep division may be, de may be defined when uh, when one side in a divided society finds its core identity in a rejection of the identity of the other side. Um, this is, of course, um, obviously connected to questions of justice and oppression um, in many cases, um, when, when, the, when, the, when the oppression is, is of one group by another. Um, where do identities come from? Um, I would say that uh, identities are generally the product of discourses. Um, they're not primordial, they're not fixed, they're not given. Um, in which case, the main task for democracy as discussion under conditions of deep division is to seek discursive meta-consensus, which uh, we can define as agreement on the acceptable range of contested discourses. Um, what does that mean in practice? Um, my favorite example of discursive meta-consensus actually comes from the Good Friday Agreement reached in Northern Ireland in 1998, uh, which contains explicit language involving mutual recognition of the legitimacy of the political aspirations of the two communities in Northern Ireland, Protestant and Catholic. Now, each community and its political leaders still find their core identity in terms of in rejection of that of the other side. Um, but instead of treating the other side as the enemy in a death struggle, uh, what, what the Good Friday Agreement does is, uh, is um, bring both sides into a discursive meta-consensus um, in which the identity, the, the identity of the other is recognized as legitimate, if, not, um, if, not, if, if still as a legit legitimate entrant into a meta-consensus, um, if, if still to be opposed. Um, again, rhetoric matters. Um, consider the difference um, in, a, in, in uh, say, the difference between, say, um, the rhetoric of Nelson Mandela in reaching across the, the racial divide in South Africa. Um, compare that with the rhetoric of the sectarian demagogues in the former Yugoslavia who've, who found the flames of, uh, um, of conflict between the, um, the, 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 dif the different national groups. Um, Okay, um, moving to the, the, the third problem of, in, of incompleteness in sense treatment of democracy, um, public reason in the singular. Uh, it, the, again, this is a, uh, the, the, the theory of deliberative democracy has moved way beyond um, its Rawlsian and Habermasian origins um, to conditionally welcome many forms of communication, uh, not just reasoning, not just argument, into, um, into deliberation. These include rhetoric, might include the telling of stories, humor, gossip, and so forth. Um, that it's possible to, um, to welcome all these things into, into a deliberative democracy. Um, not unconditionally, um, we could imply categorical tests. So, for example, Simone Chambers, who I just mentioned, distinguished between uh, plebiscitary and deliberative forms of rhetoric. Or we can apply systemic tests. Does the communication in question um, help construct, or rather, undermine a deliberate, an effective deliberative system? The kinds of communications valued and denigrated may be culturally specific. 
Um, there are, there, there's actually very little work been done on deliberation and culture, but some <coughs> research projects are underway. Um, my own feeling is that deliberation is a universal capacity, but it's manifested very differently in different, in different societies. And that's an especial challenge when it comes to deliberating global justice, because any such del deliberation will have to involve um, people socialized in very different speech cultures. Okay, um, so let me move, okay, two minutes, so I'll move to conclusion. Um, the conclusion is basically, um, to summarize, in the context of multiple and contested justice claims, we need a deliberative system encompassing all those affected by relevant collective choices, and that may reach across national boundaries. There are places in that system for both nonpartisan and partisan actors to engage in deliberation. Um, partisans should best be conceptualized as discursive representatives, um, perhaps representing different, uh, different discourses of what justice means. That system should be open to multiple forms of communication, uh, which can be held to, um, as I've just said, to categorical, both categorical and systemic tests. That system should be geared to the production of workable agreements, um, in turn facilitated by what I described as, um, as, as, as meta-consensus. Um, correspondingly, what that conception of democracy does not mean is that democracy should be confined to a single forum. Um, be it a citizen forum, be it a uh, legislature, or whatever. It should not be confined to elected representatives. Decisions should not be reached by a simple majority vote. Um, on the other hand, nor, should we strive, need to, nor need we strive for consensus in the form of um, agreement on what should be done and also on the reasons for doing it. Um, that deliberation should not be guided by unduly restrictive ideas about what, what is and is not public reason. Um, rules and ideas in particular are unduly restrictive. It should not be, public discussion should not be dominated by adversarial debate or by positional bargaining. I think we can apply these principles. These principles will apply in very different ways to different contexts, but I think they can be applied to all the contexts where justice needs to be deliberated to be achieved. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. Okay, is that going? Right, yeah. okay. Well, uh, this um, paper is a joint paper, and uh, we're going to split it up. I'm going to give half, and Suzanne Rudolph will give the other half. And um, it is a comment on Amartya Sen's phrase, public reasoning. The topic of the paper is Gandhi and public reasoning. How Gandhi democratized Habermas's bourgeois public sphere. <laughs> our paper will address the topic uh, of, of panel five, our panel here, Democracy as Public Reasoning, by showing why and how Gandhi used the ashram and more particularly Satyagraha, literally truth force, to democratize a public sphere that Jurgen Habermas had conceptualized <clears throat> as limited in time and space to bourgeois persons and bourgeois rationality. Gandhi showed a way to engage large numbers of ordinary persons in public reasoning. The nonviolent Satyagraha experience enabled them to deliberate democratically about the meaning and realization of just solutions to contested issues. We refer to such outcomes as situational truths. As the concept of civil society travels out of its quintessential 18th century European origin point to, a new, temporal, to new temporal locations in late 19th and uh, 20th centuries and, the 20, and to new cultural locations outside the West, it expresses itself through cultural forms and takes uh, different cultural forms and takes on different meanings. Indeed, it was one of Gandhi's unique talents to give new shape to institutional forms and meanings associated with liberal and democratic spheres. <clears throat> Gandhi's greatest invention may be Satyagraha. Satyagrahas took the form of nonviolent civil disobedience or non-cooperation 
campaigns to resist unjust laws or illegitimate governments. The intended consequence of such nonviolent resistance was to engage an adversary, often a government, but sometimes a civil society institution, such as a management association or a temple, in negotiations about the terms and conditions of the relationship. <clears throat> His most historic satyagraha, of course, the nonviolent act of civil disobedience taking salt from the sea, shook the foundations of the British Empire. What does Gandhi's satyagraha have to do with Jürgen Habermas's concepts? First, communicative action in the bourgeois public sphere was said to produce in said to produce laws in the public interest if those involved engage in disinterested rational deliberations. Second, Habermas finds that the, quote, essential aspect of communicative action is an aspect that was pinpointed by Bernard Manin when he said of, when he said of liberal theories and democratic thought that the source of legitimacy is not the predetermined will of individuals, but rather the process of its formation, that is, deliberation itself. Satyagraha, as Gandhi conceived and practiced it, also entails that the deliberative process or public reasoning be the source of legitimacy for communicative action. But Gandhi asks more of the deliberative process than the rationality that Habermas found sufficient. Gandhi is clear that mind without heart, reason without emotion, cannot be persuasive. In this regard, Gandhi's position accords with the recent revival of Spinoza's view of the mind-body relationship, <clears throat> a revival which calls into question Descartes' radical separation of mind and body. The neurologist philosopher Antonio Damasio has argued in a recent book, Looking for Spinoza, that Descartes was wrong to think that, the feel that feeling is the enemy of reason, and that Spinoza was right to believe that feeling was thought's indispensable accomplice. Gandhi, in effect, critiques Habermas's conception of deliberation by insisting that rationality without feeling cannot yield knowledge, truth, and the public good. Gandhi speaking, experience has shown, Gandhi says, that mere appeal to the reason produces no effect upon those who have settled convictions. The satyagrahi strives to reach the reason through the heart. The method of reaching the heart is to awaken public opinion. Public opinion is a mightier force than that of gunpowder. Perhaps it would happen in Tahrir Square in Cairo, Egypt recently seems to support this view. Gandhi is deeply concerned with ensuring that Satyagraha understood as a form of public de deliberation be public in the sense of disinterest in the sense of disinterested and transparent. Quote, I want you to feel, he tells future Satyagrahi, like loving your opponents. And the way to do that is to give them the same credit for honesty of purpose which you claim for yourself. I know that this is a difficult task. Once we begin to think of things as our opponents think of them, we shall be able to do them full justice. I know this is, requires a detached state of mind, and it is very difficult to reach, and that is difficult to reach. Nevertheless, for a satyagrahi, it is absolutely essential. You must, he says, step, it's a quote, step into the shoes of our adversaries and understand their standpoint. Gandhi, like Habermas, is in pursuit of truth, but Gandhi's truth is of a different kind. Habermas speaks of truth in the context of the expectation that knowledge can be universally valid. Gandhi's truth is in the context of a satyagraha is situational, not universal. Truth is what the satyagrahis and their adversaries find to be the common ground of their mutual understanding. It is the truth of a particular context. 
situational truth can be arrived at by listening to the adversary and, quote, putting yourself in his shoes and feeling, uh, and feeling with and for the adversary to establish fellow feeling, Gandhi's phrase. If Gandhi's satyagraha as a deliberative process works, and clearly sometimes it doesn't, the satyagrahi and the adversary come to share a common understanding of a situational truth. Yet we cannot draw too sharp a distinction between the public spheres associated with the coffee house and the ashram. Both are about civic virtue and realizing the public good. Gandhi would align with Habermas, Habermas's concern about the public sphere falling victim to proliferating and um, increasingly powerful private interests and to the self-absorption of consumerism. But Habermas's commitment to the universal truths of enlightenment rationalism as the foundation of the bourgeois public sphere stands in marked contrast with Gandhi's commitment to changing hearts as well as minds and to Satyagraha's situational truth as the foundation for a democratized public sphere. Now that's my half, and Sue will come over and give her half. A crucial feature for ensuring the disinterested rationality of Habermas's public sphere is the insulation of the public from the private. The private is seen as the realm of interests such as, in Habermas's words, normative opinions and collective prejudices. Gandhi's concern to reach wider constituencies and his commitment to the undifferentiated nature of the public and private embodied in his concept of Swaraj, led him to transgress what was for Habermas a foundational dichotomy. The fact that the transgression of the boundary between the public and the private made moral sense in India has to be read against the complex meanings of public-private found in Indian society. Modern Western conventional understandings can do little to help penetrate the older Indian assumptions and practices with respect to these concepts. In India, the meaning of privacy starts with the circumstances of the multi-generational joint and extended family. Its collective norms and its living arrangements made privacy extremely difficult. It is common to, ordinary, to see for ordinary acts and even intimate relationships to be observed. Surveillance, too, is common, re common. Rephrasing James Scott's telling metaphor, in India one can speak of seeing like a family. Privacy becomes problematic when the family constitutes an all-seeing community. Outside the faculty, family, too, in villages, hamlets, and mohallas, most quotidian activity is carried out in the open on verandas, in courtyards, in public sight. Under such circumstances, it becomes apparent that privacy is an invention of the bourgeois nuclear family, whose members live in homes and rooms with doors that shut and curtains that close. Many nominally private practices in India have public meaning. The drawing of the dupatta the woman's headscarf over her face to protect her modesty, the tying of a dhoti, the winding of a turban to, sign, to signal place, caste or community, interdining with some and not with others to mark purity and pollution boundaries or their transgression, wearing of a sacred thread to signal upper tri caste twice-born status, riding or not riding a horse in a wedding procession to mark status, the most fundamental social transformations that Indian reformers sought to accomplish over the last 150 years have been embedded what in the West would be designated private life. Urbanization and globalization have weakened some of these practices, particularly in Indian cities. But in Gandhi's time, when rural India still defined much of the civilization, these practices were dominant. In the colonial era, 
leading social reformers sought legislation in the public sphere that would change what they regarded as unjust or retrograde private social practices. To enact their principles, they defied convention by marrying a widow, by crossing the ocean, by staging intercast meals. As the feminists would want to say, the personal is political. A view that resulted in the Age of Consent Act, the Widow Remarriage Act, the Gains of Learning Act, Gandhi's first ashrams in South Africa. Gandhi's ashrams in South Africa, the Phoenix Settlement, begun in 1904, the Tolstoy Farm, established in 1910, created public spheres by asking those who volunteered to adapt their private life to the ashram's material and moral purposes. Phoenix Settlement and Tolstoy Farm were meant to be exemplary, voluntary communities. Gandhi saw them as models for a diverse, pluralist India, an India willing and able to recognize and learn from difference. The negotiations entailed in adjusting private ways of life to norms and rules shared by the ashram community were discussed publicly. Starting with his first publication in South Africa, Indian Opinion, and later in India, with Navajivan and Young India, also journals, Gandhi devoted considerable space in his publications to rendering the private public. The accounts in Satyagraha in South Africa, the book about Gandhi's time in South Africa, and in Indian Opinion, are replete with the quotidian details of negotiating the adjustment of private differences, bringing them into public view and shared practice. How to arrange the preparation of food, dining and cleaning up, these are political questions, by allowing every family to operate its own kitchen as religions and caste rules required. Most of our ashram volunteers came from caste backgrounds that forbade interdining on grounds of purity and pollution. And what about differences between those who were vegetarian and those who were meat eaters? These two are political issues. And who was to wash the spoiled dishes, regarded as polluted and polluting, and the dirty pots and pans? These private eff efforts came into the public realm. The ashram and the satyagraha as vehicles for displaying a democratized public sphere because a new kind of political theater. Gandhi moved their performance around India recreating at various sites the drama of transgressing private commitments and challenging unjust laws to create democratized public spheres. In Champaran in 1917, in Ahmedabad in 1918, countrywide during the civil disobedience movement of 1919-1920, during the Salt March in March-April 1932-30, he recreated at various sites the drama of transgressing private commitment. Gandhi's political theater was creating a new and distinctive form of the public sphere. It was marked by the visible practice of simple living, performance of physical labor, and polluting tasks, making and wearing aikari, doing for yourself, living with and learning from the comrades of diverse backgrounds. The performances were to demonstrate the asceticism and discipline required for swaraj, sarvadaya, and for the pursuit of situational truth. The ashram as a public place made greater demands than the coffee house. It challenged the Habermasian notion that the, vi the viability of the public sphere, its capacity to be the locus of communicative action and the source of the public good, required that private life and private interests be excluded from the public sphere. For Gandhi, the private sphere was the location of India's deepest inequalities and severest oppressions. Its arrangements and requirements blocked fellow feeling and common discourse, transgressing the requirements of the private realm by instituting shared living arrangements at Tolstoy Farm and other ashrams, made the political theater of the ashram an exemplar for a democratized public sphere in India. Thank you. Okay, like everyone else, first I'd like to thank Fauna and Jerry for bringing us all together, and I'd like to thank, thank Amartya Sin for this marvelous book he's written. The great thing about it for me is its interdisciplinarity. 
there are very few books in the last 40 years that have brought together as many disciplines and made them speak to each other. And the proof of the pudding, so to speak, is the fact that we're all here today from many disciplines trying to focus on these issues around justice and democracy and being able to draw on the great richness of this book to pick up a, maybe a common or cross-disciplinary language to carry forward and research this new center here at San Diego. And I think this book will be a benchmark, much the way Said's culture and imperialism was for many of us, to bring together post-colonial thought and Western thought and so on. I think this text is going to have this global reach uh, through its interdisciplinarity. So I'm deeply grateful to you for this. I want to try and uh, speak here about two ways of realizing justice and democracy, two ways that I think bring together the work of Amartya Sen and also the work of Eleanor Ostrom on cooperation. Both these uh, traditions are realization focused. In the first part of my memo, which is quite a long memo actually, I discuss Sen's approach to democracy as public reason in relationship to representative government with the aim of influencing the government or voters or public policy to bring about legislation that addresses uh, specific injustices. So let's call this democracy as public reason vis-a-vis -vis representative governments of various kinds, and these can be local, national, or global. In the second part of the memo, I look at another tradition that's both Western and non-Western, where democracy is taken to be exercising democratic powers ourselves. Democracy is self-government, of citizens exercising uh, self-government over their social and economic affairs. And I call this cooperative democracy. I argue in the paper that these two traditions are complementary. They support each other. They're almost unimaginable to me, historically, uh, to try and separate them out and imagine you could have just representative democracy without modalities and scales of direct participatory democracy, of economic uh, self-government and so on at the same time. So I want to spend in my sh the short time I have talk a little bit about this uh, second tradition, the tradition of democracy as democratic participation. The first question is, why is this necessary? And I think it's, it's the answer for, from the cooperative perspective is that deliberative or public reason democracy is limited. It's limited by what we might call, or what Professor Sen calls, the institutional structure in which public reason and representative government takes place. What Sen calls the institutional structure of the contemporary practice of democracy. The limits that this institutional structure place on democracy and public reason are unjust in two major ways according to this uh, more direct democracy tradition. First, the institutional structure of the contemporary practice of representative government and its official public spheres was spread by Western colonization and indirect forms of indirect rule which laid down the foundations of this institutional structure of modern representative democracy up until decolonization and then after decolonization this same module of representative government and official public spheres again has been promoted by multinational corporations, by the institutions of global governance and so on and codified in various uh, in international law. This way of globalizing a single set of institutions as a module for the practice of democracy <laughs> writ large is unjust because of the undemocratic way it was spread globally, often with horrendous violence and genocide and slavery. And secondly, because it either destroys or includes and homogenizes the global diversity of other forms and scale of local and re regional democracies that Professor Sen talks about in the paper. He quotes John Donne on this. It's not that other modalities of democracy disappear, but they get subalternized, if we might say, or homogenized, sometimes destroyed. The second form of un injustice in this basic institutional structure from the democratic cooperative side is that the institutions shield from democratization the social, economic, and ecological activities that are the major causes of some of the global injustices of the planet. First, the horrendous inequalities and exploitation of the global south relative to the global north, 
Secondly, the ecological destruction and climate change caused by unregulated, privatized economic development. And thirdly, this horrendous global military network that's needed to establish and put in place by violence this institutional structure and police it and, uh, in order to protect privatized forms of power. As one Oxfam author puts it, the globalization of this institutional structure of modern democracy, now called economic globalization, is a kind of 500-year tyranny against local and regional forms and scales of social and economic democracy. Now, the institutional structure shields economic and social activity from democratization by placing it in the private sphere. It does this by me the means of the civil right and liberty of individual and corporate persons to have property and labor or productive capacities and property and land and resources. They're then protected from democratization by the most powerful right in domestic and international law and international human rights and international trade law, the civil right or negative liberty of moderns to be free from democratic interference of the demos who are in fact subject to and engaged in these economic activities themselves. Moreover, the ability of representative governments to regulate the privatization of social and economic capabilities from the outside is actually extremely limited even when citizens exercise their public reason in the hopes of influencing legislation, as we all know in the last three or four years. As both Rawls and Habermas emphasized, elected officials are dependent on corporate campaign funding, governments are dependent on corporate taxes, access, voice, and communicative power in public reasoning are radically unequal, and powerful cooperations and ministries are able to influence legislation and exert control over the framing of issues in public spheres and over the influence power public deliberation is said to have on voters, elected officials, and policy communities. Five minutes, good, okay. So let's call this the tragedy of privatization rather than the uh, tragedy of the commons. Faced with these limits to democracy as public reason, deliberative Democrats seek to reform the institutional structure of representative government and public reason from the inside. And we've had great successes over the last 50, 60 years to make these institutions more inclusive, more representative, more responsive. <clears throat> and here's where our cooperative Democrats take another path, the path of what we might call social and economic democracy. But to understand why they take, the reason they take this path is because they run up against the limits of representative government and public reason vis-a-vis -vis concentrations of, of private power. But the path they take, I think, is best understood by turning to another uh, world-famous ec economist, Karl Polanyi in 1944, in The Great Transformation, and his diagnosis of what's wrong with this basic institutional structure, very similar to D David Held's argument. He says there are two flaws in this basic institutional structure of representative government and private sphere. The first is that our productive capabilities of humans just aren't commodities on the market like other commodities. They're in a way fictitious commodities. They're embedded in an intersubjective social relationships in which humans live and on which they're dependent for their well-being. When they are commodified, they're disembedded from these social relationships and inserted back into abstract and competitive relationships of the global economy. The effect of this is to damage and to gradually undermine the social relationships, communities, and social capital in which humans are dependent, yet which, from a market perspective, are treated as externalities. In response to this, Nonviolent cooperative Democrats refuse to cooperate with the privatization of their laboring capabilities. They reappropriate them, they exercise them themselves in democratically run social and economic cooperatives in common to produce the public goods they need food, shelter, clothing, security, health care, clean water, and so on. They internalize democratic social relationships or social capital. Democratic cooperative tradition, democratically run community-based organizations from Robert Owen through Peter Kropotkin to Gandhi, 
uh, Schumacher, the Swaraj and Swadeshi movements in India and Asia, to food sovereignty in Latin America, Japanese fishing co-ops, to the great global democratic networks of fair trade, as opposed to free trade, now circle the world and include more than 800 million people. The second Polanyi diagnosis is that the privatization of land and resources is again, are not commodities like other commodities, they're fictitious. Land and resources exist within webs of interdependent and reciprocal ecological relationships in which all forms of life on the planet live and breathe and have their being. When land and resources are commodified and disembedded from this natural gift economy and then inserted into abstract competitive relationships, the effect is to treat the enveloping ecological relationships as externalities, much like social relations relative to labor power, and to gradually destroy them. In response, realization-focused cooperative Democrats withdraw their productive capacities from activities based on the privatization of land and resources, reappropriate them, and exercise democratic control over their relationship to the environment understood as a global co commons. So they internalize the, this relationship with the environment. They see themselves, as they now call themselves, <laughs> Gaia uh, Democrats, as citizens of a commonwealth of all forms of life, to quote Albert Schweitzer, and as having primary duties of stewardship and caretaking of Gaia, that's to say Mother Earth, of what we can call ecological capital, parallel to social capital. For them, the basic ecological relationships of all forms of life of interdependency and cooperation are the true bases of democracy and justice, not some institutional structure imposed over this living being and treating it as private property. Again, for the last hundred years now, millions of people have built up local and global eco-democracies of various scales, from the turn to the local, to small is beautiful, to ecological footprint movement, to the global water justice movement, the Chipko movement in India, the earth democracy movement of Vandana Shiva, and again, food sovereignty here in the Americas. All these things began India and Latin America, and now have networks throughout the world. So in conclusion, what I want to say, I draw a number of conclusions the way these two traditions of democracy fit together. But maybe the simplest one I'll just mention is that what cooperative Democrats do is they, they do, they enact the principles that deliberative Democrats espouse in the public sphere. Rather than trying to influence governments, they act in accordance with the just result. They try to re realize social and economic justice here and now in every step they take or in every breath they take in some ways it's put. They, as somebody mentioned earlier, they have to be the change in their daily lives that they argue for in the public sphere. And they make this distinct uh, tradition of di direct democracy. Thank you. Um, I didn't really need an introduction. I was teasing you. <laughs> um, the idea of justice provides us with a vision of democracy that is expansive, and this is one of its great strengths. The expansive quality inspires us with a vision of achieving justice through political life and calls us to action. Nevertheless, the expansiveness leaves considerable space for further discussion about the relationship of deliberation to democracy and of de democratic deliberation to justice. The four papers, and there was a fourth paper, um, very fine contribution, elaborate on the themes of deliberation and democracy in a variety of contexts, such as small groups like villages, or non-governmental voluntary organizations like ashrams. All expand our vision, all expand our knowledge. And yet, surprisingly, none directly engages the problems of imp implementing deliberations in large institutionalized governmental democracies so as to achieve justice. And so this is the issue that I want to add to their agenda for further and perhaps future consideration. I'm going to highlight eight questions that the idea of justice and the papers pose, at least pose for those of us who study actual large-scale democracies 
in different countries. My comments are not those of a political philosopher, as Jerry pointed out, and as will, will become also painfully apparent as I proceed. They are instead the comments of an empirical political scientist who appreciates the way in which philosophers prod us to see further and deeper, but also someone who thinks that philosophers and empirical social scientists have something to learn from one another and that philosophers should pay a little attention to those of us in the empirical trenches. First is the question, what do we mean by the term democracy in this discussion of deliberation and justice? And on this first point, I'm going to be a little pointed, for which I apologize, but it is something that rankled me as I tried to think about what to say. Absent from the idea of justice is a clear explication of the defining qualities of democracy, except to tell us rather emphatically what it is not. It is not mere balloting. The closest that we get to a definition is that democracy is government by discussion. But that simply won't do. Government by discussion does not uniquely define democracy. Indeed, many oligarchies, many antique pre-democratic forms of government fit under this broad label. Sadly, any movement towards a crisper definition of in, the, uh, in the idea of justice is subverted by stripping the major alternative of its nuance and depth and turning it into something of a straw man. The definition offered by Samuel Huntington is not the simplistic definition caricatured uh, in the idea of justice. Samuel Huntington in the third wave defines democracy in the following words. In a modern democracy, the most powerful collective decision makers are selected through fair, honest, and periodic elections in which co candidates freely compete for votes and in which virtually all the adult population is eligible to vote. So defined, he continues, democracy implies the existence of those civil and political freedoms to speak, publish, assemble, and organize that are necessary to po political debate and to the conduct of electoral campaigns. That's an exacting standard. It's not one that can be summarized by mere balloting. It is a fairly common definition used in the empirical literature. It does not originate with Huntington. Indeed, it draws on the work of Joseph Schumpeter and Robert Dahl. It has been a standard for decades. How the notion of democracy and the idea of justice differs from this vision is unclear. Whether it improves on this definition is most uncertain. Indeed, it is unclear whether the view of democracy presented in the idea of justice constitutes a celebration of the accomplishments of the large institutionalized democracies such as India, such as the United States, in living up to this ideal of democratic <coughs> deliberation. It is unclear whether the idea of justice constitutes a critique of current practice in such democracies. One consequence is that the idea of justice and the papers all are using the term democracy to refer to very different contemporary phenomena. Democracy may be used to refer to a legacy handed down to us from Athens, or a legacy dating back to our ancestors in villages around the world, or a legacy of northern European parliaments. But each of these refers to something quite different in the contemporary world. And we're talking past one another. My questions two to five concern the relationship of deliberation and public reason on the one hand to the mundane practices of large institutionalized democracies as defined in the quotation I just read. Question two, are elections and balloting necessary to motivate broad participation in deliberations? At present in contemporary democracies, participation in public discussions appears to be periodic rising and falling with crises. In particular, rising and falling with elections. Without some significant consequence following from the deliberations, few are motivated to spend precious time and energy to participate. Can there be successful recurrent deliberation unless it is appended to 
democratic voting. Third, are elections and balloting necessary to make officials heed public deliberations? Without a mechanism to hold officials accountable, the officials may ignore public deliberations with little fear of losing their jobs. The idea of justice treats deliberation as a potent tool to change the course of political events. Yet for deliberation to be effective, deliberations may need to be linked to some mechanism of democratic accountability. In democracies, the major accountability mechanism is the election of decision makers. There is substantial empirical evidence, but much more could be done to answer the question whether elections and balloting are the most efficient mechanism, or at least whether elections are more efficient than alternative accountability mechanisms, such as revolutions, for aligning the incentives of officials with those of citizens. Fourth, when deliberations fail to reach a consensus, what institutions and rules do we use in order to decide whether and how to act? Some very important deliberations, such as the deliberation over civil rights in this country, have gone on for decades, have not reached conclusion. In the West, the recorded deliberations over the meaning of justice have gone on for maybe two and a half millennia, and we have not yet reached a consensus. Indeed, it may be a sign of how little progress we have made in that particular debate that we still read some of the original interventions as though they were contemporary uh, statements uh, on this issue. How do we, do we wait to act until deliberations have reached consensus? Obviously not. That's a throwaway question. But the important question is, under what conditions is it appropriate to act without consensus? How do we conclude that we have reached the point in our deliberations over specific issues where it is time to act? And how do we decide which course of action to take? Do we rely on simple majority vote by our elected <laughs> officials? If that's the answer, there's not much that is original in a deliberative approach to democracy. Majority vote by elected officials is the standard conventional answer that we have given in democracies. Or does a commitment to deliberation and public reason require a referendum with a supermajority of two thirds in order to act while deliberations continue? If you're a fan of that approach, come to California. <laughs> or does a commitment to deliberation and public reason legitimate direct action by minorities. Minorities who claim to have seen the consensus that is emerging anticipate it, anticipate the conclusion of deliberations. I would caution against that because this last claim, of course, has been used by actors around the world who seek to challenge the workings of large-scale institutionalized democracies in the name of such causes as communism and fascism. Fifth, does the dismissal of mere elections, this is a more personal point just because it reflects on my own interactions with some of my good friends who are deliberations. Does the dismissal of mere elections lead progressives to absent themselves from the most important political action in a democracy, that is, selecting the government? In the idea of justice, elections and balloting are treated almost dismissively and they get little attention in the papers. And I think many of my deliberationist friends share this view. It's deliberation and other forms of participation that are in the spotlight. Does this focus on deliberation incline deliberationists and those most concerned with justice to forego elections? I think it does. And to the extent that it does, we absent ourselves from the selection of those who are making the most important decisions. One only need look at the, the consequences of that in the, uh, in the most recent election for Congress. To the extent it is so, palaver may become the new opiate of the nattering class. 
The, la the last three questions concern the cost of expanding public deliberation. They appear to be significantly less well-informed, less respectful of different points of view, and less likely to reach consensus than the deliberations inside legislatures over the same issues. In addition, it should be noted, some referenda have led to restrictions, restrictions on the rights of minorities, such as Muslims in Switzerland most recently. In such cases, including sadly some cases here in California, it has been the deliberations inside legislatures that have led to greater protections of minority rights. Seventh, and closely related to the previous question, does the expansion of the number of participants in some deliberations reduce participation in other deliberations? If people have only finite amounts of time to give to deliberation, who decides what issues get on the deliberation agenda? Must we create a new public body that controls the agenda of deliberations? Or do we spend our finite time deliberating over what we should be deliberating? As the ample studies by empirical political science can verify, agenda control can be all important in shaping deliberations. That same logic could be extended to the need for facilitators. Who picks the facilitators, the moderators? Who moderates, who facilitates can be all important. Eighth, and finally, would it be more effective in achieving justice to concentrate on improving the deliberations inside bodies of elected officials? Could we improve legislative bodies, for example, could we improve them with rules requiring broader public hearings and guaranteeing wide access to those hearings? Would improvements of our existing democratic institutions be a more prudent investment in order to improve public deliberation that can actually lead to greater justice? The answer to these questions requires both philosophical investigation and empirical research. It requires both philosophers and social scientists working together to achieve greater democracy, improve deliberation, and to achieve justice. As a person who has enormously admired John Rawls and Amartya Sen, it is my great privilege and honor to share my thoughts and comments on Sen's work, as well as uh, three insightful papers uh, presented by distinguished scholars. Also, this conference gives me a unique opportunity to reflect on my earlier life, life experiences, as uh, <laughs> uh, Jerry mentioned. Uh, uh, I'm a latecomer in academia, and uh, I uh, spent quite a bit of my uh, earlier life uh, as an activist for uh, democracy, uh, which uh, made me spend two and a half years in prison, and uh, either for uh, economic and social justice in South Korea. First, imp uh, 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 Rudolf's paper, discussion of Gandhi, the power of uh, satyagra, or nonviolent act of uh, civil disobedience, uh, was directly uh, uh, related to my experience. And uh, I agree that for the oppressed people, the most pow powerful weapon against the brutal regime is usually not uh, violent uh, military uh, armed struggle, but nonviolent peaceful resistance. Uh, we uh, all know that. But why is that? The secret in the power of nonviolent re uh, resistance uh, can be explained by the role of heart as well as the role of mind. Uh, so uh, appealing, to, uh, mind, uh, appealing to heart can be oftentimes more powerful than appealing to mind and reasoning. And this is related to the focus on injustice. So rather than discussing the value of uh, abstract uh, uh, reasons, principles of justice, 
uh, naming and shaming of uh, instances of grave violations, violations of human uh, rights uh, can be much more appealing to the heart as well as mind of the people. Also, uh, in this sense, Gandhi's use of uh, cultural performances uh, was an effective way of communication that appealed to uh, heart and expanded uh, public deliberations and uh, uh, expanded the democratic uh, uh, and democratized uh, public sphere uh, to the uh, beyond the uh, beyond the literate uh, beyond the literate. Uh, but also this uh, role of uh, heart and emotions and the uh, usefulness of focus on injustices does not necessarily mean uh, mind and reasoning is not important. Uh, because uh, especially after the democratic, democratic transition, uh, when I worked for Citizens Coalition for Economic Justice, uh, there are many difficult policy issues that required uh, beyond, uh, beyond uh, pointing out injustices and more sophisticated discussion of uh, justice and other values. Uh, but yeah, but yeah, uh, it's true. In the struggle against uh, 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 in, in the, the democratic movement in South Korea uh, during the later years of uh, Park Jong Hee's and Chun Doan's military dictatorship, uh, it's true. Uh, while academic discussion and about the virtues of democracy, opposition politicians and di dissidents' arguments about the need for democracy played a significant role, uh, oftentimes the really the significant was increasing number of uh, political prisoners, instances of uh, torture and uh, even death, spread of information about the uh, massacre in Gwangju, those things uh, increased people's outrage with the injustices of uh, dictatorship and the sympathy for the victims of human rights violations. Uh, so that made, uh, while after the Gwangju uh, uh, massacre, there was an increasing tendency among the student movements for radical, uh, violent methods of struggle. But in the end, what really changed the situation was not the radical, violent struggle, but non-violent, uh, peaceful demonstrations that really appeal to the hearts of the people. And the role of a heart uh, and, uh, is, uh, is should be particularly important in societies where de democracy as public reason is absent. So in the struggle against uh, dictatorship, this must be very important. But also in advanced democracies like the United States, the uh, role of heart uh, seems to be important. Uh, for example, in the recent healthcare debate, you see uh, the difficult discussion about the need for universal healthcare, healthcare economics, uh, market, uh, health, uh, healthcare market failure. Yeah. Uh, uh, what uh, moves people more uh, uh, powerfully was the, was the emphasis of the misery, misery of uh, 45 or 50 million uninsured people and the documentary film of film Sico uh, than the difficult discussions. Uh, then, uh, 
Also, let me just, uh, before going to the next paper, uh, just uh, mention about the sense uh, discussion about uh, the uh, non-Western tradition of uh, uh, idea of democracy. So uh, in Korea, while I was uh, uh, involved in student movement, uh, many people said, oh, it's not feasible in Korea because uh, that's a foreign Western idea. And the Asian values, uh, 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 we don't have that tra tradition. But actually, uh, Korea and uh, Asians have that tradition. And uh, Muslims have that tradition. And uh, we are right. And the recent events show Sen is right. And next, James Tully's paper, Two Ways of uh, Realizing Justice and Democracy, uh, was also very interesting. Uh, he agrees with the saying that the pursuit of ju justice requires the pursuit of democracy as public reason. But he emphasized the limits of democracy as a public reason uh, with what he calls tragedy of privatization, uh, which produces the problem of exploitation, inequality, and poverty, problems of environmental destruction and global warming. And he makes the case for cooperative democracy, such as grassroots democratic cooperatives. I agree that extreme degree of uh, privatization uh, produce, uh, in, uh, privatization of producing and consuming capabilities uh, produces injustices, uh, such as inequality, poverty, and environmental uh, problems. Uh, so in such a situation, democracy as a public reason uh, may not be sufficient to guarantee uh, distributive uh, and environmental justice. And uh, recent research by Carl Boix shows that under conditions of extreme inequality, uh, both democratic transition and the democratic consolidation uh, is very uh, difficult. Although democracy can promote distributive, distributive justice, the functioning of democracy seems to be affected by levels of inequality. If democracy works well, we should expect that higher inequality uh, and the higher poverty should produce uh, gr greater pressures for redistribution, uh, and hence, higher inequality should lead to higher redistribution. But in fact, what we observe from the advanced countries is uh, contrary to this pre prediction, prediction, countries with the lower levels of market income inequality actually uh, redistribu redistribute more than countries with higher levels of market income inequality. This is because uh, uh, the wealthy and economic, economically powerful interests can capture and corrupt the uh, pu uh, deliberate, uh, public deliberation uh, or public reasoning to protect and advance their interests. Thus, democracy as public reason may not be sufficient uh, in such circumstances. However, I would like to slightly disagree with uh, uh, Tully in that I give more value to uh, privatization of consumption and uh, production. Probably Sen would agree with me, I think, uh, because uh, uh, he also, uh, 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 the, compared to planned economy and the rationing system, free transactions between producers and consumers uh, enhance freedoms and capabilities. Uh, although the, uh, both then uh, I, I object to the market myth uh, and uh, the extreme uh, uh, level of uh, privatization, uh, there may be some, there sh uh, uh, sh should be, uh, uh, there is value to uh, privatization as well. And uh, on the other hand, I am a bit, uh, uh, I, uh, while I value cooperative democracy, that may not be sufficient to supplement the limits of uh, democracy as public reason. Uh, probably to guarantee, uh, to promote distributed justice, we may need uh, uh, social democracy, and we may need uh, eco uh, ecological democracy. 
John Drizek's paper, The Deliberative Democracy Idea of Justice, was very inspiring to me. Uh, can I have a little bit more time? I, I cannot speak English fast. Yeah, yeah thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, in this regard, uh, and his uh, uh, discussion of deep moral disagreements and deep divisions were especially illuminating to me. In this regard, pluralism is a challenge as well as a value. Replacement, trans replacement of transcendental institutionalism by a comparative framework and focus on injustice uh, may help public deliberation, but uh, may not always solve the problem of deep moral disagreements. For example, yesterday, uh, there was a criticism on roles uh, with an example uh, of abortion. Uh, he could not uh, give a solution. But even if we focus on injustices, different people may see different injustices. Some people see grave injustice in killing fetuses. Other people see great injustice in uh, denying women's choice. In the case of healthcare, Sen argues in his book uh, between the status quo, which should mean the pre-Obama reform uh, status quo and uh, uh, universal healthcare. Uh, there, uh, absolutely, universal healthcare should be preferred uh, because uh, uh, denying universal uh, coverage is injustice. The, there is a, uh, sufficient partial orderings. But we observe many Americans see injustices and unconstitutionality, unconstitutionality uh, from the uh, Obama reform for universal health care. So the deep moral disagreement uh, also, uh, Drizek observe, uh, uh, talks about deep, uh, deep moral uh, disagreement, not only between Rawls and uh, Nazik, uh, between Sen and uh, Nazik as well. So, even if uh, uh, you take a pluralist position and uh, 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 a comparative pr framework with a focus on injustices, that may not be sufficient to solve this problem of uh, uh, this problem. Lastly, uh, it was uh, uh, be, be, uh, a bit uh, uh, peculiar to me as a student of corruption, and uh, there was a, a little discussion uh, about the problem of corruption uh, in uh, the idea of justice. Uh, because corruption and the capture really uh, is a great hindrance to democracy as public reason. And uh, corruption is in itself uh, a great example of injustice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Amartya, how about commenting for 10 or 15 minutes? Um, I'm very sorry that I missed uh, John Drasnick's uh, presentation, though I enjoyed the paper very much. I won't comment on it. I read it with um, uh, Bolton Job and Dan Prophet. There are some questions that I gather you particularly put here. I didn't hear it. I'm not able to respond to it. And maybe you and I could chat on that uh, another time. Um, I enjoyed, of course, um, Lloyd and Suzanne's uh, paper very much, as I do and you're reading their writings uh, generally. And I thought these contrast, <coughs> particularly with, the, with Habermas and, and the issue about public space and the, and the role of the private in the public, which is extraordinarily complicated thing with Gandhi. And now that all these debates are going on about what um, Gandhi might have stood for in the context raised by uh, the recent uh, uh, biography of him. Uh, I think these. I think it's very important to recognize because some of the things that are being di discussed are matters which I think, in Gandhi's life, really related to her private space rather than public space. It's it's a very complex question, and I think we get a lot of 
insights in that, um, and uh, and I very much look forward to continuing to chat with the Rudolf on that. Um, I think your study is the contrast between these two approaches, as well as the need for the possibility of combining them. Uh, it seems to me to be extremely important. I'd forgotten the relevance of the Carl Pogliani uh, connection there too. In fact, it is. I was aware of it, but I wasn't aware of it in this context. Um, we have a chance this evening when uh, Lynn and I are talking, perhaps to come back to some of these questions, because in some ways, uh, James Sally's paper is almost a preparation for this conversation, I, <laughs> I thought. Um, I, um, I could have said one or two, um, I think I like the word, the privatization issue. And the, there's one question I wanted to raise, and I think it's also a question that uh, Yong Sung you raised. Um, that is, I think that one way of thinking about private public debate uh, about the market economy and, and, the, and the role of the state and so on, which is connected with its economic efficiency, what it can deliver, and so forth. One of the, uh, I, I've never been a great admirer of privatization and the private um, world of private economy and private profit. But you see, one of the things that I think the, uh, uh, by the way, learning is extremely important in, in the field of democracy that I will be discussing when I come to Phil Roder's comment. The, one of the things that has become clear is that the world without private enterprises, with a government running everything, has an element of tyranny often, which is not easy to have. It was not anticipated, I think, in the 1920s. The, the enthusiastic uh, Soviet crowds uh, did not very much, as to namely that if you come into the bad books of the government, then every possibility of employment is simultaneously shut. The private sector has a great advantage. They don't agree with each other, and happily they sometimes compete with each other too. So that in some ways, if you can't find a place for survival under one, you might be able to get it somewhere, something else. So that's the kind of has to be factored in, in taking the approach of a comparing a, a private accepting um, um, representative uh, democracy uh, with deliberative features as opposed to the social economic democracy. I think it's one of the factors that we have learned something o over the years, which is, which is quite, uh, I think, quite important from the point of view uh, of, of both justice as well as understanding of democracy. Now, uh, coming to the last, and I leave Phil Roder because it would not come as a surprise to him that I disagree with him almost as much as he disagrees with me. So <laughs> <laughs> almost as much. May not perhaps be, maybe just a measure or two short. <laughs> um, but Jung, I, I'm very delighted to see Young Sung you here because I've been an admirer of his, of his courage, of his vision, and what he has tried to do. In, in his work in, uh, in the context of Korea and Asia. And I very much agree with most of the things, including uh, the, the way the narrowing of the, of the Asian values thing had, had contributed to an unnecessary pressure against democracy, which was not needed and to which uh, courageous people like him had been fighting. Uh, so uh, that was all fantastic. Now, um, Phil Roder, why? Do I disagree? <laughs> I think uh, the, and I'm delighted actually this paper, this presentation came. I wish it came as a form of a paper, so one could have read it rather than uh, just hearing it. Um, the reason I'm asking is because that is, uh, the, the reason I welcome it, is not because I agree with him, but because it's an interesting position, and it's a position that is often aired, and sometimes not aired, but felt. And it's good to, in such cases, it's best to see what the feelings are written out, what the complaints are. Now, basically, I think one, you didn't put it that way, there are really two ways of understanding democracy. He may say that our approach is wrong here, and, and this government by discussion simply will not do, and you get a list of 
I've forgotten whether there were 13 or 9 or 11 questions uh, about the details of this and that. Um, those are coming from an institutional perspective. And there are two ways of defining it. One is to define democracy, as Mill tried to do, government by discussion. And the institutions are their um, instruments, parameters that come and go. And we don't, may not know the answer to all of the questions. Some of it comes from learning and practice, like the one point I was just trying to make. Some of it's um, quite clear. Uh, and here I must say, I have to correct you, that it's not the case that I don't say that election and balloting is necessary. It's absolutely elections are necessary. No, there's no question. If there's one thing that emerged from historical experience, that the pretension of having uh, a deliberative democracy without elections is, would bound to be a hollow one. But there is an approach of contrast here. What Mill is trying to do is to ask the question, why do we want democracy? Well, what we, you know, uh, just as he asked the question, why do we want liberty? And, and indeed, on a different context, why do we want um, uh, equity, and which is, uh, you know, which is, takes him to declare himself to be a socialist and so on. Each question he's asking, what is it we are seeking for, uh, seeking this for? Democracy is being sought to have a participatory government. The government by discussion, therefore, is important because people participate not in silence, but by talking with each other. And whether we take the kind of interpretation that uh, Rawls gives or Habermas gives, which on which I do try to comment and their contrast and to what extent they exist and don't exist, are important questions. But underlying that, there is a motivating thing. Is it allowing people to participate with each other, interact with each other, and decisions being taken on the basis of um, um, uh, interaction with each other, which is what discussion means in this context. Election is a kind of discussion in that context. The other is to have an institution. Now there, of course, the, the, uh, that's what Sam Huntington does. And it's not a caricature, I think, to describe, because many of his features, which, he's, it, uh, which, he, which he discusses and others following him have discussed, uh, have very contingent relevance to some of these questions. And that's not, given the nature of the exercise, it's not surprising that it turns out to be. Because what institutions would work where? Depends on a variety of conditions. We talked about local knowledge. We discussed very many experimental things. We did not know, uh, and I didn't even know until this morning, until I, uh, um, uh, I, 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 um, uh, I heard um, 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 uh, I, I'm blanking on the first name, but Minnesota's paper, what's uh, your first <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, I, uh, that we they didn't know whether they had the, the rhetoric of, of being the whole, which is a part of Islamic, uh, with Muslim uh, thought, would work. It so happened it does work. And we learned something from it. We didn't know it. And we couldn't have anticipated necessarily that it would work. So I think that in any kind of practice of democracy, when you're going in a million directions, when you're trying to get somewhere, the institutions inescapably are contingent and variable. So I think the, and it may turn out like the elections have, to have much greater universality than many other things. But you know, it's not a limitation, as you seem to think, are we going to help the facilitators, or to what extent are we going to help the promoters? Well, I, I don't know. I don't know those questions. I don't apologize for not knowing it. It's not a question of seeking that detail, you know. It's a question of trying to get what is it that we are trying to achieve. And then, A, accept. There are two issues there, really. One, to accept that there would be variability in connected with contingency, which is one of the situational contrasts. I like the what I think um, uh, um, in the, uh, in, in the um, uh, morning, uh, I think James Connell used that being context dependent but not context specific. Uh, and I think, I think there would be context dependency. There's no question. That doesn't mean that the idea becomes context specific. It is still a basic idea of, of democracy by, by government by discussion. The other issue is the one that Russell pointed out. Namely, if you're trying to understand the basic idea, you have to lose some details. 
Uh, and his example was that a map of England, of the size of England, isn't very useful. Because you want to lose some detail. That is the purpose of, the, of representation. Now, to ask these questions, you haven't talked about this, you haven't talked about this. Where does the river Avon bend exactly? Uh, I don't know where it bends. And it's not relevant for the particular idea of democracy one is presenting. And you could have given not only 9, 11, but you could have given 139 questions to none of which we have answered, either in the idea of justice or anywhere else. And I'm not about to, not just because I'm 77, but <laughs> or, or also because I don't think that's a very good use of, understand, of time in understanding democracy. So I think the reason I very much welcome it what you, what you uh, did, Phil, is because you outlined the approach. You outlined what you have to do institution. That's a listing. You know, that's what um, one of my teachers, John Robinson, used to say. That's the job lot approach to economics. <laughs> Namely, just give the list of everything you need, rather than a basic idea that lies behind it. And I think the million idea, or to which I'm, I'm following, uh, and you say you have a lot of debates, with your, with your deliberative-minded colleagues, and none of them have answers for you, which <laughs> obviously satisfies you. But they, they may not feel as unhappy about it as perhaps you do about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for a terrific okay. set of presentations. Uh, I have a question for, uh, well, a question for James Tully and Phil. Uh, coming from a perspective of urban, urban and regional planning, I teach here at UCSD in urban and regional planning, so I found what James was saying about the limits of, uh, dem of democracy as public reason interesting, especially with respect to the disconnect that's happening in public discourse about some of the major mega trends that we're facing, like climate change and things of that nature. And uh, I'm wondering to what extent, Phil, you might say something about the geography of the institutions that you're talking about to, uh, for instance, we have in this country local, state, and federal. But it may be that to reconnect with the problems that we're facing, we're going to need a, a form of regional government. And I say this from the perspective of uh, the report that the National Research Council put out recently that in order for us to get um, a handle on these global megatrends that we're facing, uh, that we're going to need to have a regional scale of action, looking at food, water, and energy at the regional scale, because the globalization of the economy has created this disconnect. So I'm just wondering where geography, or what um, Amatra Sen just mentioned as sort of context-dependent democracy, to what extent does a place-based bioregional or geographic uh, dynamic fact factor into the thinking here? Yeah, well, thank you very much for that question. Just bring it close. Okay. Yes, okay. Very close? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that question. I think most of the, what I'm calling local democracies that then network globally, are place-based. They, their attempts to exercise political powers oneself, organize in a way that uh, deals with environmental problems in your region. And most of the ecological uh, social movements, if you can call them that, or community-based organizations, see themselves as, as working within an eco-region. They derive many of their initiatives and their experimental attitude and their comparisons by comparing, I, I live in that sort of Victoria, Seattle, Vancouver region, and we, we, uh, we get together across institutions uh, to deal with our environmental problems on a local scale. We, we use uh, Professor Sen's comparative method here and we look at other similarly situated humans and how they've been dealing with their environmental problems. But the key point I was making is it's, it's not that public deliberation isn't a part of it, but there's this tr tradition coming in your country from Thoreau and Emerson and Howard Zinn that says we have to do something more than demand justice in the public sphere. We have to act justly, just in our day-to-day -day relationships. 
And one dimension of that is ecological justice. So you have millions of people in the Northwest who try every day to calibrate their ecological footprint. And they uh, connect up with others, and they form self-organized societies and organizations of various kinds that address these issues locally and then network with other like-minded people. It's not an attack on private enterprise, and it's not uh, social democracy in the old interwar. It's a kind of, it's this tradition I'm very surprised that isn't in, in your book that derives from late 18th, early 19th century in the West as well, the cooperative movement, which has always been an alternative to capitalist democracy and some form of social, socialist democracy centered on states around self-organized enterprises. And it has a huge history and it's kind of dropped out of the democratic discussion, but I think it complements in a very powerful way the deliberative turn because it puts into practice what most people involved in deliberative democracy are arguing for. And these are kind of, if I can put it this way, uh, engaging in local democratic activity, whether it's an, around the environment or around economic self-reliance uh, and so on, creates a democratic ethos. I mean, you learn to be a democratic citizen with your fellow citizens. It's not, a, it's not an issue about distributive justice, it's an issue about how we become democratic, egalitarian, respectful in our day-to-day -day relationships. And one way we do it is through actually practicing these principles that you, ideals of justice that you put forward in the book. Okay. Um, Phil, one or two minutes? Uh, okay. Um, I'm, so, uh, uh, I'm going to call on, and I'm going to call people. And then David Selby. Hi, this is a this is a question for the Rudolphs, but maybe a more general point, which is, I mean, it, it, I'm, I'm referring back to, to to where where does the idea of deliberative democracy come from in the writings of Gandhi or or, or in other uh, people writing from a non-Western? I think of Gandhi. I'm thinking Gandhi here as a political philosopher rather than an activist, right? But, uh, and I'm drawing on Karuna Mantena's recent book where she points out that Gandhi drew on Henry Main, G.D.H. Cole, Mill. He was very much in the tradition of, uh, of people writing on democracy and, 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 on, and, on, and, on, on the, uh, and political philosophers writing from the English pluralist tradition that he then Indianized or internalized w within the context of what he was trying to achieve both in South Africa and in India. In that sense, he, I would place him uh, as a political philosopher in, on the same category of person as uh, the, the, the people trying to, to, trying to make, uh, understand democracy from an Islamic perspective that he heard about yesterday, or for that matter, in South Korea, from, a, from you know, what is democracy in, in, a, in a Confucian or a, a South Korean perspective, when you have to use different terms to make that language relevant to your context in order to engage in better and more symbolic and more heartfelt activism. So in that sense, it's not an alternative, but an internalized, a way of internalizing something in order to make it context specific. Do you care to comment? Uh, it's a very big question. I'll in one, or, one to two short, minutes? Very short okay. <laughs> Hello, hello. Okay, uh, uh, B.G. Rao has a great point, and I, don't, I think, uh, uh, Ram Guha once said there was no such thing as a Gandhian intellectual. Uh, he was wrong. I think Biju Rose right. I think Gandhi was a very uh, well-read person and uh, had you know took I read it, it, it was an intellectual even though he was regarded as a kind of you know a stick in the mud traditionalist. But I want to make this point about that Gandhi. And you're asking about Korea, elsewhere in the world, and what happens in India. So Gandhi uh, is, a weak, I, I think, of as an Eastern, Western, and a Western, Eastern. Mostly people think of Gandhi as very Indian. But if you read Hind Swaraj, which is one of his uh, 1909 book, very uh, perhaps most seminal book, he says there are 20, he lists 20 books at the end, which he said, these are I, my ideas, but they're not my ideas. These, so in those, of those 20 books, 
most of them are by Westerners, particularly Tolstoy, Thoreau, uh, even, uh, even Plato. And so he is very profoundly influenced by Western thought. He is what I call the other, not just the West, though. It's the other West, the West, the dissident West, the, des the West that challenges industrial uh, society and uh, consumerism and so forth and so on. Thank you. <coughs> oh, no. um, David, one minute. It's a voice of experience. Great, thanks. Uh, you know, one thing that's really nice about this conference is how much we've been able to talk to each other, I think. Um, so just to start my comment, my question, I want to start with something that Professor Sen said yesterday, which is, even if we know better than somebody, there may be good reasons for why they want to choose a less just or less optimal outcome. And what that indicates to me is we're having some debate over freedom that hasn't been spelled out quite as explicitly as it should be here in this conference. Of course, public reason tends to point us back towards Kant, Rawls, Habermas. And one, one of the main tricks of, of that sort of way of thinking is that you separate ethics and politics and you come up, you figure out what's just, and then you go to the politicians and you say, make it happen. Of course, there's another way of thinking about freedom, which is kind of implied from the capabilities approach, which is some sort of Republican or Aristotelian notion of freedom in which power is an essential part of what happens in politics and can't be separated from ethics in the way that I think Kant or Rawls or Habermas wants to do it. And there, in fact, may be really good evidence to show that the practices of freedom and using power are essential to developing our capabilities in important ways, to learning how to rank different outcomes. Um, so that's my first question, Kant or Aristotle. But what Aristotle brings me to is the question Aristotle. of, no, that's it. <laughs> what Aristotle brings me to is simply the question of power. And if we want to talk about making justice, we haven't discussed power either. And there's good reasons to think that without equal power, you will consistently have unjust outcomes, as you find in places like Rwanda, places where there's extreme genocide. Um, so I hate to be a dirty realist, but maybe the institutional solution to this is much more simple than we want to give it credit for. And it has to do with making equal bargaining partners with whom we can make compromises. So that's it. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, one last question, and then I, you know, and then um, tasty delights beckon. Uh, so it, yes. Uh, no. <laughs> so uh, you're, you're making it up to him. <laughs> so no. this isn't so much a question as a thought that occurred to me listening to this discussion about public reason as democracy, and how to maybe reframe our thinking about it over lunch, or uh, onwards. And it's this that I think we've all thought come at this issue of democracy as public reason as if those three terms, democracy, reason, and public, were terms we knew what they meant independently of each other. And then there's a, we need a theory that connects them. And the question is, do we have the right theory to connect democracy and public and reason? And you know, that means we know what the public-private distinction is, we know what the reason-emotion or reason-coercion distinction is, and we know what democracy is, that it's a form of institutions or something else. And I think maybe the way to think about this, and I think perhaps the way Amartya is thinking about it, I think the way Jim's thinking about it, I think the way everybody on the panel may have been thinking about it without articulating this, is that those three terms can only be understood in terms of each other. That is, if we want to think about what reason is in this context, what we mean is the democratically making public of ideas and exposing them to public democratic criticism. And if we want to understand what we mean by public, we don't mean what's outside the house as opposed to what's inside the house. What we mean is the process of reasoning democratically, right? Well, bringing things into the democratic reasoning uh, criticism discussion is what it is to make something public. Um, and I forgot which one I didn't do, but uh, I guess. <laughs> and then that would be one way of understanding what democracy as public reason is. Um, democracy is just the process of making public through reason, um, where those terms then have to fit into each other in a particular way. Thank you. No, we. 
Well, <laughs> no, no. Is, is, it the function, is it the function of reason to produce agreement? OK, thank you. Um, we are uh, proceeding now to lunch at the Grande Room. And let me emphasize that the lunch is for the uh, conference participants only and uh, a few specific invitees who have been specifically invited. Th this is essential because uh, of the conference budget. Um, we can't afford to feed the world unless all of you are willing to kick in a little extra. <laughs> so lunch now at the Grande Room for uh, conference participants and, a f and s a specific invitees. Thank you.